Good evening and welcome back to Vegas October 1 Sounds. Tonight we're going to refine the last video I did which was on how to align muzzle blasts to reveal shooter location or at least to reveal the the separation of shooter locations if there was more than one. So before I begin um, let's take a little review and if you haven't already done so it might be a wise idea to go back and review the last two videos that I make one was on sound propagation versus motion and the other was on muzzle blast alignment um, and if you're new to the channel then you might also want to go back and read uh, the very first video which was an introduction to gunshot acoustics and then about I think the fifth video which was the theory of gunshot acoustics but by and large if you're familiar with uh, sound you're probably not going to have too much trouble in uh, grasping the concepts in this video and understanding what's going on <clears throat> as a simple review though everybody uh, by now listening to this channel is probably aware that a uh, rifle produces two prominent sounds one is the uh, exploding gases coming out of the tip of the barrel which we call the muzzle blast and that is a spherical propagating wave front that is it leaves the gun in a sphere and propagates in all directions well almost all directions uh, in equal proportions so it's the sphere that's ever expanding uh, the second major sound that is heard by people is the shock wave produced by the the supersonic projectile and there uh, the collection the bullet produces sounds all along its path and all those collectively form a conic wavefront that is a wavefront that is a cone and the front of that cone or the sides of the cone if you will are essentially flat lines but in a conic shape which is substantially different than the spherical propagation that we see with the muzzle blast uh, we should also be aware of what distance really means in the context of gunshot acoustics distance means the pythonic or pythagorean distance namely you know if you have a point that's elevated 500 feet and a point on the ground you have to consider not only the x and y coordinates on the ground but also the elevation in calculating it so you need three terms there um, we're also you are probably also aware that the speed of sound uh, comes into play very dramatically in determining when sounds arrive at a particular distance away from their source and you're probably also aware of the fact that sound propagates from its source to where it's recorded so if you have an elevated position that is that where a sound is being broadcast you can't really ask the question how does the sound propagate from to from observer A to observer B on the ground because that's the wrong question it doesn't propagate from observer A to observer B it propagates from the source that's elevated to observer A and then it takes a second path from the source which is elevated to observer B now there's a geometric relationship between the those two paths and the people on the ground but to ask the question how long should sound take to propagate between two observers and to say that well it's a simple distance between those observ observers is uh, quite um, misleading and not correct <clears throat> uh, a lot of the analysis that I'm presenting is a, a reverse engineering approach to try to determine the nature and characteristics of the weapons and the bullets and their locations and all that. Tonight I'm going to take a little bit different approach and I'm going to combine two aspects. We're going to combine the old approach which is reverse and we're going to um, include a forward-looking concept which is a simulation. So in the last couple days I, ca I wrote a little program that simulates the uh, muzzle blast pop propagation in a 3D space and this little simulation I can stick in shooting locations and recording locations and then I can stick in you know what waveforms were being prog broadcast from each of the sources the shooting locations 
and I can simulate what is recorded and from that I can then look at the waveforms and use the technique which I introduced in the last video which was alignment of muzzle waves and to provide a what-if scenario and that's what we're going to be doing tonight is answering some what-if questions you know what if there are multiple shooters and how does that affect the waveforms what can we tell from those waveforms using the uh, muzzle blast alignment techniques so uh, this is you know it this is you know pretty simple simulation in that uh, muzzle blast propagation being spherical in nature you know the time it takes from the source to the recording location is simply you know that the Pythagorean distance between the two and that's all we consider in this program is, is direct propagation paths um, divided by the speed of sound which I'm gonna I think you know, limited in, in this particular example, I can set it to anything, but I'm gonna limit it to like 1,158 feet per second. Okay, and uh, so tonight, or in this in this little simulation I've done, is I've created a, a map, which look well. Let's just go right to the map. Here's a map of what I'm going to be simulating. And in it you'll see that we have some source locations which would be potential, you know, shooting lo shooting locations. We have room 135 here. We have a helicopter there. We have a sniper there and we have a helicopter over here. So there's four shooting locations and then for recording locations I have them spread throughout the various areas something that you know might be approximately close to you know the Reno Street up there where all the activity was Oasis apartment here the venue proper with three points labeled A B and C the bus stop and the Raymond Page and the concept in this is to emit sounds from each of these source locations all four of them let those sounds propagate to each of the other recording locations and have a simulated uh, recording of the sounds as heard from any particular location. Since there's going to be in this one uh, four sources of sound then each recording location is going to record all four of those sources and in this simulation I'm going to use two bursts per source and since there's four sources that's going to be eight bursts and I'm going to separate those bursts such that there's two bursts per source separated by 20 seconds and I use these 20 seconds because you know that starts to approximate, approximate what was happening that night in Vegas and the length between the bursts is such that we're not going to have a lot of complexity in ciphering out which burst is which because if the if the bursts get real close when you take into effect the uh, distance of the propagation distance then sometimes you know the, they can overlap so much that it's really hard to tell which is which so I'm going to try and keep it as simple as possible tonight even though you know the quantity of the sources and the quantity of the recordings may add some complexity all right <clears throat> so once again, um, we're going to be ask, basically asking a question that says, what are the limits on this a muzzle alignment technique when applied to this simulation? And we, I can change, you know, it run different some different scenarios, you know, put the shooters further or closer, put the recordings in different locations, and I'm only going to cover this one scenario one scenario tonight, and I think from this one scenario you get a pretty good grasp on both the limits and capabilities of the simulation and the limits and capabilities of the uh, muzzle blast alignment technique. All right. So once again, we're going to be simulating strictly the muzzle blast and then the muzzle blast, how it propagates from where it's created, i.e. the source of the sound to where it's recorded. And I'm going to limit this to what we call direct path propagation, that is line of sight. We're not going to be including, 
um, refractions or diffractions or uh, re reverberation or reflections or anything like that. This is simply line of sight, straightforward propagation of a spherical wave that's emitted at a point source. And what I'm going to simulate is the time of arrival. That is, a sound will leave a source and arrive at its destination, or actually there is no such thing as destination. It's the sound will take X amount of time to travel the distance between the source and where the recording is happening. And that's simply the Pythagorean distance divided by the speed of sound. So this is really a very simple simulation. It just, you know, we're going to use it on multiple sources and multiple lo uh, recording locations and then see how our muzzle blast alignment technique reveals certain key factors about the sounds. And once again, this is a, a forward-looking simulation with reverse engineering applied at the back end. So for the four shooting locations, I think I've already briefly, I'm going to choose something that approximates room 135 with a 350 foot elevation. I'm going to have uh, a, a location that approximates a shooter, let's say at the Blue Man Group area, and then I'm going to have two helicopters both of them at 550 foot elevation, uh, one that's south of the Mandalay Bay and one that's east and uh, north a little bit of the venue. And then for the recording locations I'm going to have three points within the venue proper you know covering the uh, south end and the east and west side, not so much on the north side. And then I'm going to have uh, something that simulates the bus in a location that approximates the the bus stop and a location that approximates the beginning of the Raymond Page video a location that approximates the Oasis department and then of course you know that, that way distant location Reno Street North um, in doing these little uh, simulations and applying the the uh, muzzle blast alignment algorithm you, you quickly learn that the bigger the area that's covered with your recordings, the more information you can gather and the greater the accuracy of the results. If you limit yourself strictly to uh, recordings that are in the venue proper, say like what you must do for you know the first shots, the only sh things that were recorded that recorded the first shots were you know local to the uh, venue in the in the middle of it. There were no recordings of the first shots out of the Oasis department or some of these remote locations. So in that case where you're forced to a limited set of recordings that are, you know, very narrow in scope, you have to be careful about the accuracy of both your location and the measurements of the times of arrival because small errors can produce large uh, errors in, in the results. Okay. Um, got that, got that. Yeah, the speed of sound that I'm going to assume tonight is 1,158 feet per second. And that it's constant. That there's no variation in the speed of sound due to wind or moisture or temperature or anything else. And we're going to assume that the muzzle blasts are point source. That is, they're equal in in uh, propagation in all directions and there's no funny business going on with directionality which is not quite accurate because muzzle blasts are in fact directional that is some parts of them are louder than others even though it's still essentially a sphere and we're going to also assume that each reco recording location records all of the sources which is in my experience, uh, found to be true on almost every recording. Oasis Apartment records, you know, the uh, supersonic shock wave uh, generated for, you know, multiple volleys. And it's way off in the boonies. Same with up there at uh, Reno. Uh, there's adequate information from several of the volleys that uh, I can measure both the muzzle blast and the shock wave and, and produce a lag measurement. All right, <clears throat> and as I alluded to earlier, each shooting location or source contains two bursts, 
of four rounds each separated by approximately 20 seconds. And then uh, the next uh, sound that's heard right after the first burst of, the f of one of the sources will be about five seconds later and it'll be the first burst of another shooting location for a grand total of you know 32 rounds and what I did was attempt to make each burst unique in the timing so that a an individual burst could be identified uniquely and it gets kinda tough at the scales we're talking because when you're looking at an overall of about 40 seconds for the total duration of this event uh, you know small variations of a few milliseconds are not noticeable unless you go down to an extreme magnification All right. then when we're all said and done and, and we've got all these simulated recordings we'll take a look on, at aligning various events within the recordings uh, to see what we can determine about uh, how many shooters there are and where they might be located. But more importantly, uh, the main question I'll be answering and focusing on tonight is how many shooters are there? Alright, so let's get over to it. As you've already seen, this is the map. And so just taking one situation, let's take the uh, sniper location over here somewhere near the Luxor and that sniper will emit four rounds in a, in a short burst of, of about a tenth of a second per round. He'll wait 20 seconds then and emit four more. And now those sounds will propagate from the sniper to C, sniper to B, sniper to A, sniper to Ray, sniper to Bus, sniper to Oasis, sniper to Reno. And as you can see the distance between them, and these are all elevated and elevation is not shown here but it is taken into account in the calculation of the distance are you know pretty pretty different uh, the distance between the sniper and the three locations in the middle of the venue are not so different so the variation amongst them is going to be much smaller than the variation in going to the oasis on the bus for example or the Raymond Page area and Reno alright so let's take a look at a graphical representation of the sounds being emitted by each source. Okay, here we go. As you can see, there's four sources. So here we are at room 135, and we emit four little bursts. Then we wait approximately 20 seconds, and emit four little, four little, uh, not four bursts, but four rounds, and four little more rounds. And as you can see, this burst is substantially wider than this burst and I did that on purpose so that I could identify them quickly even though the algorithms don't depend on it it's easier for for you know you and I to see and then up here with the helicopter with the uh, helicopter located uh, north and east of the venue at five seconds after the first burst from room 135 it emits four rounds which you know you can see there's they're substan substantially different, not a lot, but substantially. And then 20 seconds after it, it emits a second burst. Similarly for the helicopter and the sniper, you know, they each emit two bursts of four rounds each, and we'll have a grand total of eight bursts of four rounds each, or 32 rounds. And it'll be spanning a total of 30, let's say 37 seconds. Now those are the sources. Now let's take a look at what each recording area records. All right. So here's all one, two, three, four, five, six, seven recordings. So this is just as though you picked up, you know, the audio from any of the videos that people have recorded. And in this case, you know, these would be very, very, very similar to the muzzle blast arrival times for any particular recording which was close to the selection that I've made on the map. So you can immediately see that they arrive at all different various times. Now because of the spacing between the bursts, the uh, bursts themselves tend to line up in a gross scale thing. So here for example you can see that these groups of bursts are all limited to about 21 seconds to 20, uh, two and a half seconds. So 
the difference in arrival time for some of them is close to two seconds and the, the arrival times for the the uh, locations a b and c in the venue here you can see is uh, probably on the order of less than a second but more than the width of one pulse which is about 0.4 seconds so, but these two for example the points a and b due to the orientation and geometry of the source and um, the receipt, the uh, recording, they only vary by about you know a third of a, a volley, which would be about 0.1, some, a little bit more than a tenth of a second. But in all cases, we're not talking millisecond; we're talking hundreds of milliseconds. So that's the first takeaway you get from this: is that almost regardless of which uh, recording you're talking about and which source that the variation amongst the arrival times is going to going to vary from you know probably a, as little as a tenth of a second to as much as two seconds and those are all you know easily measurable numbers and easily distinguishable um, since uh, also you can observe here that for the locations which are further away which would be Reno and Oasis that the arrival times are much much longer or after the arrival times of the uh, closer things. So the bus being one of the closest ones, the volleys arrive there first, at least from the perspective of room 135. From the perspective of um, the sniper, they would probably arrive a little later than some of the other ones. Okay, so those are the raw recordings. So we have 32 rounds in each recording, eight volleys or bursts as you will in each one and there's seven so we have <coughs> quite a number all right so uh, the basic of the muzzle alignment technique is to pick any event but the same event for all volleys so I could pick the first round fired or the first burst or you know the 15th round fired or whatever and then I find that same exact point in all the recordings and I produce a plot that has all of those events precisely aligned and then we can look at what happens with all the other rounds so let's do that let's align these first rounds from the first burst for all recordings and uh, plot it graphically just like this same exact Recordings only just shifted. Okay, so here we have it. We have the first round from every recording aligned to the exact same position. Well, you can immediately see that this group and this group over here at 20 seconds later line up precisely, but yet none of the others do. Well, if you remember how I started this out, you know, I, I said that each group would fire one burst and then 20 seconds later. So in this case, you know, we have a little bit of foreknowledge that this is the same shooter. And that's going to be the second big takeaway here. For the same source, if you line up one event from that source, and it, then all the other events from that source line up accordingly and that's because the source isn't moving okay I mean, and you can see where this is going to go very quickly so and the the third takeaway is that none of the other sources will line up so we can quickly see that we have um, events at time zero and events at time 20 come from the same source and all the other events do not we've still not determined how many other sources there are so what we'll do is just pick another event and see what other things line up. In this case, I make it simple from, for the program, and I just pick the first event from e each burst here and then see what lines up. Now, of course, that depends upon somebody being able, to, or some program, either way, I don't care, being able to determine uh, one event uniquely across all recordings and that can be a very difficult job at times because these muzzle blasts all are very 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 similar but 
for example, in this case, if we were to say, well, let's take the first event from this group, you could see that it's close. There's four of them there, but they're very, very close. And so I could uniquely identify that. And that's pretty typical of what happens in Vegas, is that the time in between rounds is slightly different. You know, there's gaps that are bigger. There's gaps that are smaller. Uh, you know, think some things are uh, shaped differently because of their distance, all that sort of stuff. And so it, it you know, it's entirely feasible to do. And I've actually mapped out about 8,000 muzzle blasts now across, you know, oh, it must be 30 or 40 recordings by now. So I have a, a vast array of muzzle blast timings recorded, and I can play this game precisely with any and all of them. Okay, so if we look at this at a little bit greater detail, because if I look at the first four volleys from each of the recordings on the same type of graph, I'll get a little bit better idea of what's happening underneath because it's like zooming in. So let's zoom in. All right. So here we see, once again, the first event from the first volley on all the recordings is lined up, and you see that there's no difference whatsoever. It lines up. Now on here we don't see the 20 second mark, but we do see here that some of these things are substantially spread apart and some of them are much closer together. In fact, these two events right here are so close that if we didn't have these other points of reference we might consider them the same as this one, as being part of the same group. And that's why having multiple sources located at various uh, places across the entire spread of the recording field is very important because if I didn't have the Reno and Bus and Ray and Oasis points then I'd be left with just these three and I might conclude that C you know is a fluke and that these two actually belong to this grouping. So m multiple samples are good just one sample or two samples is not good. All right, and let's look at the second half of this, and here you see that the time at 20, which we had already identified as belonging to the group from room 135, and the others do not. All right, so let's go ahead and take the um, first event from the second uh, volley. That's this one. And we line it up, and then on this graph you can see that we have oh 20 seconds later we have another group lineup which is what we expected and yet none of the others do so here we've identified a second group and in this case I know it to be the helicopter which is north and east of the venue okay and we can continue to apply this so for example on uh, the let's take the eighth event which is since they're starting a number at zero this would be zero through three uh, four through seven and this would be eighth one so it'd be this group so we're going to align this group now and see what happens and once again you'll see that there's two two and only two um, groups or volleys that belong to this source or are coming from this source and we can apply it once again to 12. We can apply it to all of them. And you see here, this, then this time it's this, this group, or this burst and this burst. And those came from the same source, and none of the others came from, uh, in this case, the Luxor Sniper. So, using just alignment techniques, we can quickly identify, without knowing ahead of time, that there's four, at least four different shooting locations. And what we would do is, is continue to uh, continue to move across this and apply the same technique to make sure that there's only four, which we know to be true. But let's just do it. So if we go from uh, the first round in this one to the first round in this one, i.e. the 16th event or 16th round in the recording. I did hit, hit that, didn't I? Yeah, okay, so the 16th. So we, now we see that... It's this one we're lining up, but also then back here, this one lines up. And, you know, you could do it for the rest of them, and it demonstrates the uh, 
the principle works and limits it to four groups. So, what have we done here? Well, if you step back and take a look at the big picture and say, if all these volleys were coming from the same source and that was a static source, then they'd all lined up and that would be a correct assessment. In this case, they don't because they're coming from four different sources and the four sources being having different locations, they don't line up. And the real takeaway of this is if you already know that what happened in Vegas, all the volleys line up. That is, they come from one source, it's fairly static, it's not completely static, and it's somewhere near the Mandalay Bay at an elevated position. So this technique confirms many, many other observations that I've made and other people are making that for the volleys, for the sounds recorded for the volleys, to the tune of, you know, more than 10,000 data points, there's only one shooting location. It's somewhere near the Mandalay Bay. It's from an elevated position. It's fairly static with, you know, small variations in distance. And there's no helicopter in position involved. There's no sniper at the Luxor. There's no ground shooter, nothing. All the volleys come from one small area. <clears throat> and so let's go back and, and think about that for a second. So you might say, well, what would happen if we moved uh, any one of these positions close closer to room 135 and 130 and say how close can we put it and still get a different reading and what does it look like or what happens if, if we move one of the sources out here into the middle of the concert what would happen or what happens if we move the helicopter over it well surprise I'm gonna save that for some other videos because the answers are still consistent and this alignment technique still works but the closer you get the shooters to the recording devices and the closer you pack them together it starts looking to like a little cacophony of, of, of volleys that's not what we see in Vegas okay so we know that those types of shooting locations are already precluded but it is interesting what happens nevertheless and the algorithms still work it's just that there's not these um, nice separations here. And one of the other things we learn is that in creating this sequence of events here where I, I, I chose five second separations, uh, that if the width of the gap between the bursts is about three to five times greater than the width of the burst, then it becomes pretty easy to identify these bursts as, as separate events because the whole propagation time from one side of the venue to the other even going out from let's say from Reno to uh, Mandalay Bay is only you know a couple seconds so any shift in the time of arrival is going to uh, have a maximum of a two seconds therefore if the gap between bursts is more than two seconds like three to five times then that gap overcomes all, you know, alignment uh, errors. And that's the big takeaway. Now, if we move a, a source, you know, to within 10 feet or in the middle of all those points, then the delay becomes very, very small. And the relative position to the volleys after alignment, and that can actually get very confusing because the uh, difference between them ends up being on the order of 10 milliseconds or so. And that's where you have to have very fine measurements i.e. very accurate measurements and you have to have very accurate positioning for your spots which in this case since it's a forward looking simulation we do we know down to the foot but in the reverse case you know placing those videos at an exact location within one foot is typically not possible heck I even have trouble getting them down to within 30 feet which is why you always hear me qualify my estimate of where things are um, with an error value and that error value for me is saying yeah okay <coughs> pardon me um, uh, southwest elevated position from the venue uh, elevation 300 feet 
plus or minus 150 or 200. So then that error margin is important. And I don't care whether you're using triangulation, multilateration, a fusion of both shock wave and muzzle blast, or just muzzle blast or just shock wave. Uh, those same criteria uh, come into play. The geometry of the recordings versus the geometry of where the shooters or shooters are, it makes a big difference. So you have to be careful. Now this kind of technique doesn't tell you whether or not there was more than one shooter at the same location because if there were three shooters at the same location firing different guns at different times you know wouldn't make any difference for the purpose of alignment here okay let me go back and uh, think for a minute and review this and see if there's anything else I want to say oh well I guess we could say well where am I going to be taking this program in the future. This is, you know, just a, a two-day first cut at a simulation applied against the muzzle blast alignment algorithm. And it's proven to be, you know, quite useful. I think it's also proven to be very informative for those people who are kind of on the fence as to what it all means. It's also clearly demonstrated that for all, for the for the recorded for shots which leave a, a, a an acoustic impression that there really is no hiding the fact that there are or are not multiple multiple shooters at different locations and we can pretty conclusively say that for Vegas that night there were not I can't tell you how many shooters there were at wherever this the final ultimate position turns out to be and I will eventually narrow it down to within 30 or 40 feet but I can say that there weren't two things and I can definitely say that there weren't helicopters involved in any of the shots that are recorded on any of the volleys. Now, that's a pretty strong statement and it's substantiated with two or three different algorithms. Now, I've shown you the lag, I've shown you the muzzle alignment, and there will be a couple more that I'm going to show you. And if that body of evidence isn't enough to make people at least set up and listen, then I'm not sure what will. So, this is one more technique based upon real data that's been measured, based upon real uh, simulation that uh, puts the theory of acoustic propagation into practice, producing a simulation which verifies things. And so what I'll do with this simulation is I'll get these in the, in, you know, in the near future or sometime, is I'll get these positions down to as best I can, simulating the real positions, and then I'll put a, uh, you know, I can feed any uh, sort of sound source that I want into these various sources. And I'll, I'll put in some more sophisticated sounds, and I'll produce a semi-sophisticated recording. And then I'll compare those recordings against the actual recordings that were made that night and see if there's more information available for extraction. <coughs> now, from this... Um, from this data alone there's a lot more information that can be extracted because once you align this the relative positions of all these tell you something about the shooters location and it's very similar to uh, multilateration multilateration or triangulation but that uh, involves considerable more math and uh, definitely is going to be one of the later videos because that's just icing on the cake, you know, taking it down to where we can pinpoint uh, the location to, uh, you know, within 30 feet, I think. Uh, let's see, what else? Yeah, so anyway, I'll refine these locations. I'll um, start simulating the actual rounds that were fired. So I'll start feeding, you know, 100 rounds separated by 20 seconds, 95 rounds separated by 15 seconds. And then I'll take that and I'll compare them with the actual measurements that I've made across all of the muzzle blasts. And everything should, should, should align up. Now the difficulty comes in is that there's not a lot of positions that re of the recordings that were absolutely static most of them had some form of movement. They were running away or running closer or 
going back and forth or all sorts of things and, and so there we have to account for the change in arrival time as a function of the, this motion and that that was sort of discussed in uh, um, two videos back but I have to build that into the simulation and that's a, a non-trivial process and then if I get really ambitious I'll go ahead and start building in a simulation of the uh, this the uh, bullet trajectories and hence a prediction of the uh, shock wave and then at that point in time we should have a real good understanding of just about everything we need to know in terms of the bullet trajectory uh, the muzzle blast arrival time the, the shock wave arrival times we won't have any idea about the relative volume well we could I guess put in a simulation for that but the relative volumes or timings but that'll come so anyway I hope this has been informative I hope it's been a refinement I hope it uh, gives you a, a, a little bit more confidence in the fact that we are that I am using real techniques with real data and I'm approaching it from the front going forward I'm approaching it from the rear end going inward and the two meet and they jive and everything looks good so anyway that's uh, Vegas October 1 sound signing off for the evening and we'll grab you in the next one